I want to get into the Scriptures with you. Um, if you would like to follow this in an actual Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 17. And uh, I, I taught on Acts 17 a couple of weeks ago, um, and I want to visit another story from Acts 17 this morning. Uh, you will find message notes and discussion questions on the Bayside Church website and the app as well. You select Connect with God and then Messages, and it will bring up for you uh, today's message, which is entitled Search, Wrestle, Question. And you can just click on that and it will bring up the message notes for you. I hadn't intended to teach on this uh, today. I actually had another message, and then I was having a converse, conversation with one of our team during the week and they mentioned to me that after the last two Sundays they've gone home and had some really really good conversations some robust conversation about the sermons and I'm so encouraged by that I love it when pe people go home and and talk about the sermon I, I don't like it when they have pasta for lunch so they don't devour me but they devour the scriptures and one of my goals in, uh, in teaching Scripture is that it will get you thinking and talking in the right way and, uh, and questioning and digging deep into this incredible book that we call the Bible. And so as a result of that conversation, I decided to kind of springboard off what the staff member was saying to me and I will um, to preach what I was going to preach this Sunday um, in a few weeks' time. Uh, and so um, the discussions and questions that this particular person asked were in response to my last two sermons. And uh, the two sermons are called Engage Your Filter and The Condensed Bible, and you will find both of those online. So if you missed out on those, you can go to the Bayside Church website, you'll find them on the homepage, and you can either watch them or listen to the message. And so Acts chapter 17, and just a quick recap here, because we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. This is Paul's second missionary journey. And so he and Timothy and Silas and probably others are wandering around, going from city to city and proclaiming the gospel. They, their pattern was that they would always go to the synagogue first, because it was like low-hanging fruit. There would be Jewish people uh, there, who obviously were believers in God, there would be Jewish proselytes, that is, Gentiles who had become Jewish. So the men would have gone the whole hog, you know, circumcised the whole deal. But then there was also a third category of people called God-fearers. And they were the ones kind of on the outskirts of the community. They believed in the one true God. Um, and, but, but the guys particularly were put off for being proselytes. And one can understand that, yeah? Um, and the, all the uncircumcised men said nothing at all because they didn't want to give it away, right? <laughs> Awkward. So he would always go to the synagogues first. And, and so there was this three groups of people there who already believed in God. They, they were reading and studying the Scriptures, i.e. the Old Testament, and, and many of them were waiting for a Messiah. So when he got there and he shared the good news, he had this ready audience. And there were people there who loved the message and were excited about it. And there were other people who didn't like it because they wanted to conserve the status quo. They didn't want change. Um, and we still have people in the world like that today. They're frightened of change quite often. So they try and conserve the way everything is rather than embrace the new. And so in Thessalonica, there were a particularly vicious group of those who wanted to conserve the status quo, um, and, and they set about to try and harm Paul and Silas and Timothy. And so that's the backstory, and that's where we pick it up from this morning in Acts 17 and verse 10. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. It appears that Timothy may have stayed in Thessalonica. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character. And I want you to note those words. The Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. And then Luke tells us the reason why they were more noble. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, 
Many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek men, women and many Greek men. In other words, the Gentiles, God-fearers. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the Word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. And so what was happening here was that Paul was obeying the words that Jesus had given, that Matthew records for us in 1023 of his gospel, when you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. And so that's what Paul did. He didn't have a persecution complex. He wasn't standing there going, well, I just want to die for Jesus. You know, no, I'm, get me out of here. These guys are trying to kill me. They're trying to hurt me. I'm going to go somewhere else. But this advice that Jesus gave didn't mean fleeing to another place to hide. It meant going somewhere else to preach, to proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul did. He went to Berea. He landed there probably on the Sabbath morning and he went straight to the synagogue and he started to proclaim the gospel again. Now, I want us to go back to the statement that I highlighted in our text today, um, and, th and that is uh, from verse 11 of Acts 17, um, noting that the Bereans were of more noble character. It's an interesting statement, of more noble character. It's referring to an attitude of their mind. The Berean Jews, proselytes, and God-fearers were fair-minded and they were open-minded in the right possible way. And as a result, they did two things. Number one, they received the message with eagerness. I love that. The Bereans received Paul's message with readiness, not with bias, not with prejudice, not with preconceived ideas like the Thessalonians. They were two things. They were humble enough to be told something, and they were open enough to re-examine their beliefs. I think humility is actually foundational to us learning, uh, having a teachable spirit. In fact, David mentions this in, in Psalm 25 and verse 9, God guides the humble in what is right and teaches them His way. And so I invite you, as we follow Jesus together, that we maintain that humility of mind that says, I know a lot, but I don't know it all. <laughs> I've, been, I've been reading and studying the Scriptures now for well over four decades. I got to say, very young. <laughs> and you know, in my, in my younger years, I, I, I used to think, you know, if you could just read the whole Bible and study the whole Bible, then you would understand it all. And I thought there would come a day where I would just have it in this kind of neat package and go, that's it, I've got it covered now, I've got it all sorted, ask me anything you want, I know everything. And right there, it would be a terrible time because we haven't arrived, amen? We, we're, not in, we, we, we're invited on a journey and it's an exciting journey. And in Scripture, as we, as we read and study and go deep together, we need to maintain that humility of mind and heart that says, I don't know it all. And I want to learn something. Teach me something. Open my mind and open my heart and show me ancient truth that I've never seen before. You know, we say sometimes, oh, I've got this new revelation. Well, it isn't. Well, yeah, it is and it isn't. It might be a new revelation for us, but it's an ancient truth from thousands of years ago. And the Holy Spirit has just highlighted it. It's wonderful. So don't, let's not be know-it-alls. Let's not be Sybil Faulties. One of my favorite scenes from any Faulty Towers fans here? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So a few. And anyone absolutely cannot stand Faulty Towers? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I hear you. Um, I, 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 I'm married to someone who does not like Faulty Towers. So, any any time we watch, in fact, Christy watching a comedy. Do you, have I ever shown you this before, Christy watching a comedy? 
So the kids are like rolling around and Christy's going, oh, it's not funny. <laughs> or Mr. Bean, you know, and we're all laughing. I love Mr. Bean. And Christy goes, oh, he's so annoying. I've got to, I got to, just this little side story here. I'll tell you a, a story. Um, this is years and years and years ago, actually. We were at Peter and Kay Kinross's for a barbecue. This is back in the days of videos. And we'd had a barbecue together. There was a few people there. And then Pete and I decided we'd go and get a video. You remember this story? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we went to the video shop, and the last thing Christy said before we left was, make sure you get a comedy. And I'm thinking, why? You know, we'd been married for about three or four years at this point, and I'd already kind of caught on. Don't, don't get me wrong, Chrissy has a great sense of humour, right? It's just that the things that she laughs at and the things that I laugh at are often very different. Very similar to you, you know, when I tell a joke, and it's just not funny. And so Pete and I go out and we, we, we go down to the video shop and we did everything we could to get a comedy, and, and, but there was nothing going. And, and we both wanted to watch The Last of the Mohicans. <laughs> so that's what we got. The Last of the Mohicans, Cowboys and Indians, Arrows, Tomahawks, you name it. And we put it on and Christy said, did you get a comedy? And I said, yes. <laughs> and, and so we're watching and, and no kidding, we got about 10 minutes from the end of the film. And then this little Irish voice pops up. This isn't very funny. <laughs> it was funny right then because <laughs> everybody else was in on it. It was absolutely wonderful. It was so good. But Sybil Fawlty, right? She's sitting up in bed, single bed, um, and then a, a dresser, and then another single bed, and Basil's uh, in the other single bed, and he's trying to read. And Sybil is on the phone. And I think she's got her hair in curlers and she's smoking a cigarette and she's eating chocolates in bed and she's talking on the phone to someone and she keeps on going, oh, I know. Yes, I know. I know. All the way through and Basil loses it in the end. If you know, why are you having the conversation? So let's not be Sybil faulties when it comes to the Scriptures. Yeah, we know some stuff, right? But there's a whole lot of stuff that we don't know yet. And it's so important that we maintain that humility of mind and humility of heart. None of us have arrived. None of us have got it all wrapped up neatly. The Bereans were humble and open to re-examining their beliefs, even though Paul's teaching contradicted their former views. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm, I'm not talking about core beliefs, all right? If it, I, I think that there are certain truths within the Christian faith that are absolute non-negotiable. And, and, and if I ever start preaching in a way that contradicts the non-negotiables, I will be the first person to leave, right? <laughs> It's, I'm talking about everything to do with Jesus, right? If I, if, if, belief in God, belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, uh, born of a virgin, sinless, 100% human, 100% divine. He lived in a time in history. He walked amongst people. At a certain time, he died on a cross to pay the price for our sins. He rose again three days later. He ascended into heaven. He's ever living to intercede for us so that he can save us completely and one day he will return. They are the non-negotiables and I believe in those and they are rock solid. But we need to understand that on all of the other, the negotiables, if you like, Christians have disagreed on and do disagree on. That's why there's about 40,000 different Christian denominations in the world today. And who's right? Well, all of them. Because they believe different. There's lots of different beliefs on lots of different things. And so we need to hold those things lightly. Um, and, and, and so I encourage you to do the Berean thing and humbly and eagerly listen. But don't stop there. The second thing is this. The Bereans examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They examined, they did a deep dive, they read their Bibles, and, and, and they meditated and discussed Scripture, and they made it a daily practice. 
can I encourage you to do the same? You know, if, you're, if, you, if you've got that devotional every now and again with Jesus, it's supposed to be every day with Jesus, right? And I encourage you to have a part of your day and make it work for you. It might be listening to the Bible uh, on, on an app as you drive to work in the morning or something similar. Make it work as part of your lifestyle, but have a, 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 a part of every day where you are listening to or reading, thinking about, meditating upon the Scriptures. I have made a covenant with my eyes that the first thing that I will look at in a day is the Scriptures. And that's really important because it's so easy to get caught up in the news and social media and all of those things. And all of those things are fine, but they can wait. I want the first thing that my eyes look at in the morning, other than Christy, is, is the Scriptures, is the Holy Word of God. Can you say amen? And so the Bereans examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Examined there means careful investigation. No doubt they did this together. They would have read and discussed and maybe debated with each other, all very healthy things to do. And I encourage you to do likewise. The Bereans weren't gullible where nothing is wrong, but neither were they cynical where nothing is right. The result of their open-minded, humble inquiry led to faith in Jesus for many Jews and Gentiles. Let's be like that. Let's search the Scriptures. That's number one today. The second major point is this. Question what you hear. Just like the Bereans. Every time I teach the Scriptures, whether it's a sermon, a blog, a podcast, or Tuesday Night Live, I do so as someone who is trained and studied diligently for many decades. But that doesn't mean I know everything. It doesn't mean I'm infallible. It doesn't mean I'm always right. And it certainly doesn't mean that I never change my mind. In fact, I have believed and taught things over the years, and I think about even some of the things that got me into the Christian faith when I was 19, and then seriously from the time I was 21. And, and, and that day, it was late 70s, it was all about the end of the world, end times, the rapture, the mark of the beast. I thought that, you know, I was so excited this is 1977, 1979, when I made a really serious commitment for Jesus, and the planets were going to line up in 1983, and that was going to cause cataclysmic events on the earth, and it was going to be the beginning of the Great Tribulation, and Jesus was coming back in 1988, because that was 40 years after Israel became a nation, and I'm like, wow, isn't it amazing? Like, all of history has been waiting for Rob Buckingham to become a Christian so this whole thing can be wrapped up now. How proud was I? What happened? Nothing. <laughs> but it got me in the room. And But the things that got me in the room are not the things that keep me in the room. Some of that, so I remember having a conversation with one of the guys at Bible college. I, I'm pretty sure it was my first year in Bible college, so 1985, and, and he and I were having this conversation about, about revelation and, and end time stuff, and, and he told me he didn't believe the rapture was going to be before the tribulation, and I was horrified. He walked away from the conversation, and I thought, well, 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 shame, he's going to hell. <laughs> True, that's exactly what I thought, because he believed wrong in my mind. And so, yes, I've changed some stuff. I can look at some old sermons and, and look, by and large, they're, they're, they're still pretty good. But there's not one of them that I would just pick out of my filing cabinet in my office upstairs and preach again. It would be reworked. Why? Because I have grown and I've learned more and I'm more mature now. There's certain things that I wouldn't say. There are other things that I would add and all of that. And I think that's wonderful because as I said before, it's not just about a destination, it's about enjoying the journey. And so question what you hear, whether it's from me or somebody else. It's not wrong to question. Now I understand in some churches it is wrong to question and maybe you've had a negative church experience where you had questions and you asked them and you were shut down or maybe you were talked about uh, or maybe you were kind of 
ostracized a little bit because you had a differing opinion. I want to tell you, uh, I can't talk for everyone in, in our church family, but as far as I'm concerned and our pastoral team, we welcome questions. That's why I put discussion questions on the message notes every time I preach. Why? Because I want you to take those questions and go deeper. I want you to take them into your connect groups if you want to. Uh, you can have spontaneous groups. You might be out with a few mates or a few ladies for, for, for coffee or whatever, and you're having a discussion, and you want to go deeper, and you go, you're asking questions about the Scriptures, and that's wonderful. I've got a great little cartoon here that will get put up on the screen. I love this. Welcome to the faith. Now, here's our complimentary box, outside of which you should never, ever think again. Let that never be said of Bayside Church. I'm going to make a couple of significant statements, and I want you to think about these. Uh, we're going to put them up on, on the screen for you. The first of them is this. The Bible is not just a book of answers. It was written to provoke questions. Think that through for a moment. The Bible is not just a book of answers. It was written to provoke questions. And the next point, Scripture should never be used to shut down a discussion. It should be used to generate debate, discussion, talk. Um, I, I can't stand it when some, you're having a conversation with someone or maybe it's, it's a discussion on, say, Facebook or something or other, and you're having this really good discussion and people are putting up different views and points and all of that, but then you'll get one person, and this has happened to me so many times over the years, you get one person who doesn't like the discussion and they want to end it. And so they, they just put up a Bible verse. And so it's like, no, because this verse says that. And it's like, oh, okay, are you telling me that we actually can't have this discussion now? When, when you use the Bible in that way, you're actually misusing the Scriptures. It's not meant, Scripture is not meant to end a discussion. It's meant to generate discussion. And so they're two very important statements. Um, as you read and study Scripture, what questions can you ask about the text or the story? I suggested three questions last week. And they're in your notes from last week. The three questions from last week are, number one, how does this point to or reflect Jesus? Remember the Emmaus Road, Jesus' discussion, and he showed from all the Scriptures everything that was said about him. What an amazing Bible study. And, and so we should be able to do that. Whatever you're reading in the Scriptures, how does this point to or reflect Jesus? Question two, in what way or ways does this draw me into intimacy with Jesus? Question three, does this verse or story align with what I know about Jesus? Remembering that Jesus is God's last word to the human race. The beginning of Hebrews tells us that God spoke in various times through the prophets and other ways, but in the last days, He started speaking through His Son. And so the last word to us is Jesus Christ. And when we're looking at the Scriptures, we must do so through the lens of Jesus other questions that you could be included uh, are these, and they're all in your message notes. Why do you think the people acted in the way they did? So you're reading a story, maybe particularly some of the stories in the Old Testament. Why did the people act that way? How would you suggest they should have behaved? Uh, next question, how would you respond in similar circumstances? Were they good people who responded poorly because of experienced trauma? I want to reflect on that for a moment today. Think about the people of Israel when they're going through the wilderness. We need to read those stories uh, as, a, as a group of people who had experienced four centuries of slavery. And, and when you start to read those stories in that context, you understand a little bit about why they behaved like they did. And so we need to understand people that have been traumatized invariably act in, in, and can act in quite negative ways. And we need to understand that backstory when we're reading Scripture. A great question to ask in all of those stories is, what would Jesus do in similar circumstances? It's like those, you know, those bracelet, bracelets, WWJD. Apparently, Jesus had a bracelet like that with WWID on it. <laughs> A 
A question has power that surpasses the answer. The Bible and God are supposed to be explored. It's healthy engagement that, if done with respect, causes growth because you wrestle with the Scriptures together. There's a wonderful story about that in Genesis chapter 32 where, where Jacob, it's, a, it's a, an unusual story, but Jacob literally spends all night wrestling with this guy. And he's wrestling with a man. And, and, um, and, and, but as you read through the story, you realize that the man is actually God in human form. And after, at the end of the story, um, God says this to Jacob, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Wow. Put that in your theological uh, pipe and smoke it. <laughs> You've struggled with God. So the name Israel actually means he struggles or they struggle or wrestle with God. And I love that concept. Church, it's okay to wrestle with God, to grapple with Scripture. The Bible permits us to search and question. Now, this might be counterintuitive to those of us who were raised in a Western context, because if you have been, like myself, raised in, um, in a European-dominated society in England, and then when we emigrated to Australia, if you are um, raised in Australia or America or any European country, our thinking processes will be influenced very strongly by the Greeks, okay? And so it was all very pragmatic. It was all about finding the right answer. This is right and that is wrong. And I'm not talking about relativism here. I'm not talking about making up your own morality. Please don't misunderstand where I'm going with this. But that's our, that's our formation uh, here in this country. It's all about this is in, that's out, this is right, that's wrong, this is black, that's white. And then we come to the Bible with that mindset, but the problem is the Bible is an Eastern book. So if you've been formed um, mentally, educationally in an Asian country or the Middle East or Israel, for example, which is where the Bible is from, then your thinking is very different. Your thinking is, is, is not just about coming up with the right answer, it's about investigating and, and looking at and asking questions and having discussions and discovering truth that way and then putting the truth into action so that there's change in our life and change in our environment as a result. The scriptures reflect our messy life experiences. We can read its pages and find stories and songs and proverbs and principles that resonate with everything we're experiencing in life's ups and downs. The Bible has done its job if our discussion caused powerful, positive change in life. And that's why I encourage you, search and question and grapple, so important. Go deeper in your connect groups. Have great discussions together over food. Um, make it spontaneous, as I mentioned before. Now, I want to wrap this up today, and I realize that some of what I've shared with you um, may make us, at times, feel uncomfortable. Because especially if you're the sort of person that likes to know um, everything that's rock solid, um, and, and you might get kind of waylaid a little bit. Is something falling over? Oh, no, we're all right. You might <laughs> thought something was falling over behind me. Um, I'm glad it's not you. <laughs> all good. Um, I want to give you an anchor point uh, as, I, as I wrap up today. Um, and it's one word. And the word is this, simplicity. Simplicity. Whenever I have doubts, this is something I do, whenever I have doubts and confusion or unanswered questions, and let me be really transparent with you, it happens to me a lot because I don't know everything and I haven't arrived. And I'm sure I'm in good company. As I said before, I am rock solid on the core values of our faith, on the non-negotiables. But for other things, sometimes we can feel a little bit all adrift. Whenever I'm feeling that way, I always bring myself back to the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Who He is, what He did, 
what he does and what he's going to do. Simplicity. We lose simplicity when we try to make our faith more complex than it needs to be. When Jesus was asked by his disciples, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Jesus' disciples, of course, the context of this is that they were jostling for position. They were grown men who were acting childishly. And Jesus reminded them that they mustn't be childish, but they must never lose their childlike qualities, even as they mature. The Bible is an exceptional and life-changing book, but it's not always easy to comprehend. When I'm confused, I return to simplicity, which is beautifully illustrated by this story that I'm going to tell you. Uh, this is Carl, about Karl Barth. Uh, he was a German theologian. He is considered to be the greatest Protestant theologian of the last century. His prolific theological studies and writing shaped a century and were instrumental in combating liberal theology. His commentary, the Epistle to the Romans, is considered by many to be one of the most important theological treatises of all time. Bath's theology found its most sustained and compelling expression through his 13-volume magnum opus, The Church Dogmatics. I just want you to think about that for a moment. This guy was smart. 13 volumes on church theology. Widely regarded as one of the most important theological works of the last century. The Church Dogmatics, <coughs> dogmatics runs to over 6 million words and 8,000 pages and is one of the most extended works of systematic theology. In other words, Karl Barth was well acquainted with the complexities of Scripture. With that background in mind, listen to this story. Karl Barth, in 1962, was at the Rockefeller Chapel on the campus of the University of Chicago during his lecture tour of the U.S. After his lecture, one lecture, during a Q&A time, a student asked him if he could summarize his whole life's work in theology in one sentence. Bath responded, yes, I can. In the words of a song I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Beautiful. Simplicity. And that's where I invite you to rest. All the discussions are wonderful, the questions, the digging deep, wondering. But at the end of the day, simplicity. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's my anchor point. That's your anchor point. And I invite you to anchor yourself in everything about Jesus, because He is everything to us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank You for Your Word today. And I pray, Lord God, as a, as a family of believers, as a community of people who follow Jesus, that we won't be shy of questions, that we won't shut down conversations and discussions with Bible verses, that we'll ask ourselves questions when we read the text, that we'll enjoy the journey of discovery, like iron sharpening iron, when we're together, connect groups and spontaneous catch-ups. Lord, I pray that as a community of believers, we will always anchor ourselves in the simplicity that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. To your glory we ask. Amen.